This is the video lecture for the lesson, The Mystery and Mission of the Church. This video lecture is for the Theology II class at the East Asia School of Theology. So, why did God create the church? And what is the mission or purpose of the church? Some people view the church as a social club that one joins to find new friends or to make new business contacts. Others see the church as a powerful group of potential voters or a political force to be harnessed to accomplish their goals. Still others see the church as a dangerous, archaic institution that stands in the way of progress and that needs to be eradicated by peaceful means if possible, but by force if necessary. So what is the mission or purpose of the church? This is the question that we'll be looking at today and we'll be looking at the mission and purpose that God gave to his church. Now, when we talk about the mission and purpose of the church, one key word we need to look at is the word mystery. One of the key words that the New Testament uses when talking about the church is the word mystery. Now, we, we especially see this word that's used a lot in Paul's writing, but the word mystery in the New Testament has a very different meaning than the meaning that the word mystery has in modern English today. In English, the word mystery usually refers to a story, a movie, or a TV show in which a crime has been committed and a detective or a team of detectives is trying to find out how the crime was committed, why it was committed, and of course, who committed the crime. Now, the Greek word that is translated as mystery in the New Testament is the word mysterion. And mysterion has two basic meanings in the New Testament. The first meaning is something that is hidden or not fully known. We see this, the word used this way in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. And this is the more generalized usage for the word mysterion. And it is more closely related to the definition of the term mystery in English. But there is a second basic meaning for the word mysterion in the New Testament. And that is, it refers to something sacred, which can only be known by God's supernatural revelation. And this is how the word is used in 1 Timothy 3.16. Now this term, this second term, use meaning for mysterion, is much more particular and much more specialized. And so it, it, it is much closer, it is related, it is more specialized and it's more related to New Testament usage. Okay. So these are the two basic meanings for the word mysterion in the New Testament. So how is the word mystery used in relation to the church? Well, the first way that the word mystery is used in relation to the church is it is used when talking about the mystery of the kingdom. For example, in Matthew 13, 11, Jesus said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. In other words, when Jesus spoke 
um, many of his parables, most people could not understand his parables. That's because he was communicating secret, uh, secrets of the kingdom to his disciples, mysteries of the kingdom. Okay. So this is one of these are some of the mysteries that have been entrusted to the church. Another mystery that has been entrusted to the church is the mystery or the, the uh, revelation that there are now no distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. Um, Paul writes at length about this truth in Ephesians 2.11 to 3.13. And in this passage, at one point, he talks about how God has, how Christ has torn down the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles, and how now that we are in Christ, we are one body in Christ. And so when we live out the truth of this teaching and show the world the unity that can be found in Christ, how we are one body, that is living out this mystery. Another mystery that God has entrusted to the church is the mystery of Christ. In Colossians 1, 24 through 29, Paul writes about this mystery. And in verse 27, he says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so this mystery is the fact, is the truth that Christ dwells in us. And now, because we have quite Christ dwelling in us, within us, we now have the hope of glory. So this is the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ living in us. Another mystery that has been entrusted to the church is the mystery of Christ and the church. Um, this is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, where Paul says, This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Now, this, the context for this is that this verse 32 comes at the end of, a, of an extended passage in which Paul writes about how husbands and wives should relate to one another. And then in verse 32, he says, he talks about how the relationship between husbands and wives on earth is actually a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. Um, this, this points back to the video lecture that I gave earlier on metaphors that we have that help us to understand, better understand the nature of the church. And one of those metaphors that I talked about was of the bride and the bridegroom, of how in that, in that metaphor, the body of Christ, the church, is the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And so we talked, we looked at how this metaphor speaks of Christ's love for his church. Well, this is the mystery of Christ and the church. And so what Paul is saying here is that the relationship, the marriage relationship between men and women here on earth provides the world with a picture of what Christ's relationship with the church is supposed to be like. So there are some other important passages in the Bible that deal with this mystery that Paul spoke of. For example, we have Romans 11.25 and 16.25 through 27. Um, in these two passages, Paul reveals that Jews will one day 
come to faith in Christ. So God revealed through Paul that Jews will one day come to faith in Christ. And so this is a great mystery. How will this happen? We don't know, but this is the promise that God gave to Paul. And this is the prophecy that he gave to Paul that Jews will one day come to faith in Christ. So that is a mystery. Another um, important passage that speaks of mysteries is 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 10. And in this passage, um, Paul writes about how this mystery they speak of was hidden in the past, but has now been revealed to those who follow Christ by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the idea is that this mystery was kept hidden for many years until the church began and God poured out his Holy Spirit. And then through the Holy Spirit, God revealed this mystery to his church, to those who follow him. So what are the basic meanings of the mystery of the church? Well, essentially, the mystery of the church means that distinctions between the Jews and the Gentiles are done away with in the church, which is the body of Christ. It also refers more generally to the unfolding plan of God for the redemption of humanity through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of his son, Jesus Christ. So, we just we look at the mystery of the church, and now we're going to look at the mission of the church. Now, this mystery will help us better understand the mission of the church. But let's look at the mission of the church. What is the mission of the church? What is the purpose that God has given to his church? Well, part, one part of the church's mission is to glorify God. Um, we find this expressed in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21. Now, what does glorify mean? What do we mean when we say to glorify God? Well, to glorify someone or something is to honor, praise, Law, appreciate, and exalt him, her, or it. Okay. Um, much of this is done through worship, but our perspective on worship may need some redefining and expansion. And we will talk more about this later in, in the course. Now, um, many people have this mistaken understanding that when we are in heaven, that worship will be a boring thing. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And one way I like to explain how exciting worship will be in heaven is to compare worship in heaven to a rock concert. Now, if you've been to a rock concert, what happens is a lot of people pack into the auditorium and they're excited. They're, they're, they're so excited because they come to listen to music by one of their by their favorite singer. Um, and so in many cases, many fans actually idolize these musicians. Okay. So the crowd is excited, they're waiting. And then all of a sudden, the musician comes out on stage and the crowd just goes wild. Well, that kind of excitement is a foretaste of the kind of excitement that we will have in heaven. Because if you think these people are excited about their favorite musician, how much more exciting do you think it will be for us to see God in heaven? 
Okay. Now, the other side of this is that many times in the real world, in everyday life, we know that worship is not all that exciting. And so that's why we may have to redefine our understanding of what worship is and redefine our perspective so that we can redefine this and expand it. And that's one of the things we'll talk about later in this course. Okay, but one of the ways that we glorify, so one of the ways that we glorify God is through worship. We also glorify God through, by holy, loving God and others. We glorify God by bearing much fruit. And this again uh, reminds us of one of those metaphors that we looked at in the video lecture on metaphors of the church. And that metaphor is the metaphor of the vine and the branches, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Um, and so one of the ways we glorify God is by bearing much fruit. Whether that fruit is through the, the fruit of godly living, the fruit of the spirit, or the fruit of evangelism, right? We also glorify God by displaying the wisdom of God in making the Jews and the Gentiles one body through the gospel. Now, the apostle Paul spoke out a lot about this because for one thing, he himself was a Jew. And so this was a great concern to him. He was a Jew, but he also was aware of the Gentile culture. And he was um, familiar with both the Jewish culture and the Gentile culture. And so he had this passion for seeing the body of Christ be one body, to be unified, just as Jesus prayed in his um, priestly prayer in John 17, on the night that Jesus was betrayed. And so when we when we are able to live together as brothers and sisters from different ethnic backgrounds, from different national backgrounds, from different languages, from different social and economic classes, when we're able to live together in unity and love one another, with the kind of love that Christ showed us, then we are showing the world a very powerful picture of what the body of Christ is really all about, that we are one, one body, serving one Lord, proclaiming one faith, okay? And so when we do that, when we live to get with one another in peace, not necessarily without friction, but in harmony with one another, we are bringing much glory and honor to God. Another part of the church's mission is to glorify Jesus Christ. And this is one of the things Jesus prayed for when he prayed his priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He asked God to glorify him. He asked God to glorify his disciples. And he asked God to enable his disciples to glorify himself. So when we glorify Jesus Christ, we are fulfilling the mission of the church. Another part of the mission of the church is to reflect Christ and be his body as we carry on his life and ministry to the world. This is, this is one of the ways that we can glorify Christ because when we show love towards others, when we share with others, when we speak words of life to others, when we build others up, that reflects Christ's character. 
Okay. Um, so reflecting Christ incorporates aspects of holiness as well as care and concern for the lost and hurting and poor of this world. Because the truth is, God cares about all people. Another part of the church, church's mission, is to edify believers. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. This is where the writer of the Hebrews of Hebrews talks about not neglecting gathering together. Um, and this is talking about how when we come together, we are able to edify each other. Edify is a word that means to build up. So when we come together and we build each other up, we are fulfilling, helping to fulfill the purpose or the mission of the church because we God did not create us to be lone rangers. In other words, he did not create us to live our Christian lives in isolation from other Christians. And right now in this age of COVID, this is a very real issue that we need to um, recognize and deal with because we need to realize that living in isolation is not God's intention for us. He means for us to live in community. Um, and that may look different in different cultures, but he does intend for us to live in community with one another. So when we build each other up, this helps to fulfill the mission of the church. And one other um, aspect of the church's mission is to bear witness to Jesus Christ and to fulfill his great commission. Um, this reflects the central nature of the gospel of the church. After all, what is the Christian church without the message of Christ? His work and his identity and his significance for us and the whole world. And so it is with this spirit that we will look more closely at the Great Commission as a major purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. So now we're going to look at the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Well, this is the definition that one man named Dr. Truman Million Martin wrote. Now, I'm not making up this name, but this is what he wrote. And it's a very good definition. He said, the Great Commission is the instruction and command that Jesus Christ between his resurrection and ascension gave to the church through the apostles concerning the path of the church between the ascension and the return of Christ. So what is the Great Commission? Well, it's the set of instructions and commands that Jesus Christ gave to his disciples concerning the work he has for the church until he returns. That's the Great Commission. Now, there are a number of passages in the Bible that talks about that talk about the Great Commission. And there are five major passages, and I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with most of these, if not all of these. And it's interesting that these passages are found in each of the four Gospels and the book of Acts. So these passages are Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Mark 16, 14 through 20, Luke 24, 44 through 49, John 20, 19 through 23, and Acts 1, 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Now, there are some other passages that are also closely related to the Great Commission. One of these is, is the extended passage from John and John chapters 13 through 17. This is also known as the Upper Room Discourse. And this, these are the teaching or instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed. And it is during this um, period of instruction that Jesus gave that metaphor about the vine and the branches. He also talked about the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit would do after he left, um, and, and a number of other things. And so these passages are also close, this extended passage is also closely related to the Great Commission because it explains, gives us more detail about the Great Commission. The same is true of John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. And this is the Great Commission that God, John, that Jesus gave to Peter. Um, this was after Jesus' resurrection. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me more than these? And so Peter said, yes. And then Jesus gave Peter his great mission. He said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Um, and we have the great commission to Paul, which is found in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, Acts 22, 3 through 21, and Acts 26, 9 through 20. So in Acts 9, we, we have the story of how uh, Paul was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians when he was blinded by a great light and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Um, and so this was Paul's conversion experience. And immediate and it, during his conversion experience, uh, Paul not only came to faith in Jesus, but he also received a call from God to be a missionary to the Gentiles. And so this. This also gives us um, some further um, insight into the Great Commission. So, what is the task of the Great Commission? Well, the task of the Great Commission is this. We are to proclaim the gospel, that is, the forgiveness of sin, and to make obedient and well-grounded disciples of Jesus Christ, okay? That is the task. So we are to proclaim the gospel and we are to make disciples. So what are the methods that are involved in the Great Commission? Well, we are to do, we are to carry out the Great Commission by going, teaching them that all, teaching other people all that Christ commanded and baptizing them as Trinitarians. That is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This includes proclaiming and preaching the gospel, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Okay. So those are the methods that we are to follow in carrying out the Great Commission. What is the geographical extent of the Great Commission? Well, the Great Commission is to be, um, is to be carried out to all the ethne in the world. Um, ethne is the word that is translated as nation in English. But a better um, way to understand ethne is not to understand it as meaning a political nation, the, um, 
the nations that we see on political maps, but rather ethne refers to ethnic groups or people groups. Because the reality is, in some nations, there are lots and lots of different ethnic groups. You know, um, in some African nations, you can find 50 or more different languages that are spoken by the people who are living there. Or if you look at a nation like Russia, Russia covers 11 different time zones and has literally hundreds of different ethnic groups. So when we talk about preaching the gospel to all nations, it, is, it would be better to understand the, the word nation as referring to different people groups or different cultural groups. Okay? So what is the temporal extent of the Great Commission? In other words, what's the time period for the Great Commission? Well, Jesus tells us that the end will not come until all the nations have heard. This is from Matthew 24, 14. And the gospel of this king will be preached as a witness to all generations, I mean, to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus also promises us that he will be with us even to the end of the age. Thus, it appears that the path we have extends for as long as we continue waiting for Jesus' triumphant return from heaven. So that is the temporal extent of the Great Commission. Now we have the means of the Great Commission. We talked about method, but let's look at the means. The authority, power, and presence of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the means or that these are the, this is what equips us and empowers us to carry out the great mission. The spirit comes and gives us power and Jesus' power and authority is also with us always, even to the end of the age. Now, when we talk about the great mission, there are some different views of the Great Commission. And these different views um, all, have to do, all have to do with how they answer this question. How do we measure the completion of the Great Commission? So is the Great Commission fulfilled when Christians have preached the gospel in every nation? Is it, is it fulfilled when all people have had the opportunity to hear the gospel message? Well, sometimes people, people have to hear the gospel message more than once before they really understand what it means. Is the Great Commission completed when at least one church has been successfully planted within every people group? Has the Great Commission been completed when the Bible has been translated into every language? Or is the Great Commission completed when there are mature Christian disciples in every people group who are living out the Christian faith? Or should we use some other metric for measuring the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Okay. Now, some see the task of the Great Commission fulfilled in very general terms. Um, all the nations, meaning all the countries of the world, while others see the need to extend the gospel to every tribe, tongue, and ethnic community. Some others see the task primarily in terms of evangelism, while others see the task more focused on discipleship. Many see the need to plant multiplying churches in every ethnic community of the world, 
before the world can be considered reached. So there is, this is a very live question. How do we measure the completion of the Great Commission? And um, this, this is a difficult question to answer, as I hope you see now. But it is a question that we must wrestle with because we that will help us to better understand the dimensions of our task of the task that remains. So today we talked about the mystery of the church, and we talked about the mission of the church. And I hope understanding the mystery and the mission of the church will help each of you in your ministry.